Hey all, new day and new verses. We continue on into Isaiah. Today we're going to be picking up with chapter 30, verses 23 to the start of verse 29. And as we get into it, Father God, just thank you for the opportunity to gather together. Thank you that we can do this. Thank you for the pain relief to do it. Thank you for the the beauty scene, the opportunity to discuss. Thank you that you're just with us. Thank you that you are with us through it all. You know, whether we are in a wilderness season, an exile season, or or whatever it may be, you're with us. So we can focus on the praise. We can focus on the fact that you are with us. We can focus on you. Let that be our focus. Let you be our focus. Holy Spirit, come and dwell as you have your will and your way in us, in our lives, and in this world as it is in heaven. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for the three the meals, Lord God. Not just the, the physical ones, but the spiritual ones. Lord God, have your way in me. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. That we might stand shining as a city on a hill. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 23. Then Yahweh will bless you with rain at planting time. There will be wonderful harvests and plenty of pasture land for your livestock. The oxen and donkeys that till the ground will eat good grain, its chaff blown away by the wind. In that day, when your enemies are slaughtered and the towers fall, there will be streams of water flowing down every mountain and hill. The moon will be as bright as the sun, and the sun will be seven times brighter, like the light of seven days in one. So it will be when Yahweh begins to heal his people and cure the wounds he gave them. Look, Yahweh, the Lord is coming from far away, burning with anger, surrounded by thick rising smoke. His lips are filled with fury. His words consume like fire. His hot breath pours out like a flood, up to the neck of his enemies. He will sift out the proud nations from destruction. He will bridle them and lead them away to ruin. But the people of God will sing a song of joy. Now, I know reading it like that, you're just like, okay, yay, happy moment, and holy crap, judgment. And I've been thinking about this a minute here. And there's a reason for it, right? My beautiful mate has to go, my beautiful bride has to go back to Canada, unfortunately, within a fortnight because of the whole 90-day things, and I'm glad God is in control. And while dealing with it, I've been having the line from Deadpool pop into my mind. You know, the life is a series of hellish nightmare with brief commercial-like interruptions of joy and excitement before returning to your regular schedule program of suck. And that's what it often feels like in life. And when going through these texts as we have Isaiah as a whole, it is this back and forth dichotomy between, yay, God will redeem, and there's judgment to come. And it needs to happen, right? We all want justice. We all want righteousness. We all want fairness. We all want it set right. That means it needs to be set right out there and in here. In here is where it can be set right before he returns, because out there... Out there, we need to enforce the fact that the enemy has no power, no authority to use it. This, okay, Revelation, yeah, absolutely, the enemy has power. But authority is what matters in these situations. The authority is God-given. Jesus took it back at the cross. There is no more authority that the enemy has over our lives when we are redeemed by Christ so we can look at those places and moments and go, I'm not going to be beaten by this enemy. I'm not going to be consumed by it. I'm not going to lose. And the only way we can stand in front of the face of that enemy is by knowing where to kneel, by knowing where to rest, by knowing where to Shabbat, by knowing where to take comfort. And it's interesting, the, the Bible talks constantly, especially what we've been seeing in Isaiah in the last couple of weeks, right? In peace, in quiet comfort, in rest, in this trust place, that is where your salvation lies. That's where your abiding is. But all too often, we don't want to do that. You know, we get focused on the idea of the Deadpool-like mentality of, yeah, it's just pure suck and there's the occasional commercial-like interruption of happy. But that's not the case. That's not the case for us. And when we live in that mentality, we're giving the authority of what kind of day we're going to have over to something else. 
instead of saying, no, that moment was difficult, but this day will get better. And that's the difference. Because this switch back and forth of this hopeful moment of, yes, there will be good grain, yes, there will be hope, yes, the enemy will finally be slaughtered, a hope that we all have, especially on this side of Christ, that finally, done, no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, that the enemy, death, hell, and the grave, all thrown away and done with, finally. Because it's not right. It's something we all too often choose, and that's the problem. That's what needs to be rectified, the fact that we are making those choices. And I find it just amazing that even when the Lord comes, it's His words. You know, in one translation, the 28, it's His hot breath. In another translation, 28, it's His words consume like a flood. His words consume like a hot breath. Right there, revelation imagery, the swords in His mouth. All the way back to Genesis, the same idea. The Lord God, creator of the universe, the true sovereign Alpha and Omega, the one who is revealed by the Son, doesn't need to play this silly little game of, oh, good versus evil. He is the good. His simple word defines, because he is the creator of it all. So when religion gets it twisted and thinks, oh, it's this battle of good versus evil, no, it's not. Because if it was a good versus evil battle, then you have to have an understanding of what actually is good for this side to be aligned with it and that side to be against it. There has to be a higher definition. He is it. And he is revealed by the Son. Only an intimate relationship can we truly get to know the Father because only the Son knows the Father and only whom the Son reveals the Father to can know him. That's Jesus' words himself, admittedly stumbling over my own tongue. But that's the idea. Only the Son knows the Father. Only the Son can reveal the Father. And so it is going to a place of quiet rest and trust. Going, okay, we're going to call it out. We're going to call a spade a spade. We're going to live in a way that puts others first. We're going to see what we want others to do for us. And we're going to take the initiative and do it for them. We're going to forgive the unforgivable because we have been forgiven as such. We're going to pour out grace and mercy to flesh and blood because flesh and blood doesn't know any better. And we are going to stand up and say the principalities and the spirits and the foolish thinking and the true enemy is what needs to be fixed. The enemy in here that decides, oh, let's kill each other rather than actually work towards shalom. And the only way that can happen is if we believers start taking a stand and say, no, no, let's do it different. Let's live by example. Let's change the focus. Instead of thinking, oh, it's a series of suck with brief commercial-like interruptions of joy. No. It is joy. It is promised joy. It is the knowledge that we will go through this wilderness season. We will get through this exile place. It is remembering that Jeremiah 29.11 is written to people who have passed through exile, hell, and flame. It has been written to people who have been taken from their home, everything stripped from them, and turned into slaves and turned into the nation who beat the snot out of their own people and crushed their nation. That's who Jeremiah 29.11 is written to. It's not written to people who, oh, I had a parking ticket. It's written to people who have gone through some shit. So when you're dealing with it, and don't get me wrong, I'm not belittling anything. We all go through different places. We all go through different sufferings. We all go through different trials. It's the perspective. It's the perspective of realizing this is written to people who have gone through hell, so you will make it too. This is a promise written to people who have everything stripped away, so you will make it too. This is written to a people who have been made slaves. You will make it too. That's the promise. The promise that when the Lord comes to set things right, the nations that stomp on the necks of the innocent will have their necks stomped on. That those who smash down the orphan, the widow, the immigrant, the hurting, the needy, the poor, not just the fiscal kind, but the outskirts of society, the other, the nations that build up on the backs of that will be rectified. Because a nation steeped in blood must be washed white as snow. Either through surrender and trust and praise or through destruction and cleansing. Because even that promise is here. 
That idea that, oh, when the Lord begins to heal and cure the wounds he gave them, that the light of the moon will be brighter and the brightness of the sun will be brighter. Well, that's happened. We have actually can study measurably that the sun has gotten brighter since this time was written. And since the moon is essentially just a giant reflective surface, so is the moon. Because it is reflecting the sun's light. A beautiful imagery that reminds me of this uh, one sermon in late 90s, early two, maybe mid-2000s of Be the Light, or Be the Moon. We're reflecting the S-O-N's light. We're living as that city on a hill because he has made us as such. So that when everybody else is thinking about the insanity and the evil and, well, let's just go out and no. We call it out. We stand in resistance the way Jesus did. That beautiful call of nonviolence is, is, I'm not going to pick up the sword, but I'm not moving. I will bandage your wounds, but I'll let you kill me before I move an inch. Because that's what Jesus did. He let the weight and sin and hell and punishment we all deserve kill him before he moved an inch on saying whether or not he loved us. Before he moved an inch on going, no, no, that one is mine. That it was better to get nailed to a cross than it was to give up on any one of us. And if that is his perspective, how dare ours be any different? If that is the way he puts others first, how dare we do less? If that is the way the master does it, the servants certainly ought to do the same. And we are far better off than simple servants because we are no longer called servant. We are called friend. We are called friend by the same King of Kings and Lord of Lords who called Judas friend even as he was being betrayed with a kiss. That's the mercy of our God. That is the mercy of our King. That is the grace we get to run toward when we stop holding on to our own definitions and our own destructive ways. When we take those thoughts, when we take those moments, when we go, nope, 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 is not going to be a life of commercial interruptions of joy. It's going to be a life of joy that has moments that remind me God is with me too. As Job said, we take the good, should we not also take the bad? It's a perspective shift of trust. I can be focused on missing each other, going out in a fortnight, and however long it's going to be till we're reunited again, God knows. And I'm praying it is not the three years we were kept apart for COVID, because that sucked. But hey, we got married halfway to our ninth anniversary together. And this time together has been a beautiful gift. These two weeks together will be a beautiful gift. And my focus can either be on the miracles God is working in my midst, or it can be on a deadline that I don't even know what's between now and then. It's a perspective. I can be focusing on whether or not I'm going to make it to the end of the run however many years, or I can focus on the run I can do today. I can focus on suiting up in my armor today. Salvation, righteousness, peace, truth, faith, salvation. I know I said it, I'm going to say it again, because salvation covers the head. It's the helmet. It focuses the mind. Because remember, this is Paul. We're talking Paul's time. We're talking about. It's had Hellenistic influences. No longer looking just at the Greek lev or, or the Hebrew lev. We're looking at the Greek idea of the mind. Because the entire idea is putting on Christ. They're more than just words. They're a way of living. They're a way of living that recognizes when the Lord's anger burns. It is because there is stuff that is wrong. We understand His anger burns because our same anger burns. And not against flesh and blood, against principalities and people, uh, principalities and perspectives. Not people. Not flesh and blood. The true enemy was defeated at Calvary. We enforce that defeat daily. In our minds, in our hearts, in our souls, to borrow the Greek idea, in our lev, in our nefesh, in our ma'od, to go back to the Hebrew and the one we've been using. It's all about laying it down before the Lord so that our lives become an offering incense that is pleasing to the Lord. 
one that actually looks like him. Not just in form, but in function. So that we truly do live as the children of God. Kingdom Manifesto, right? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. That is who he is. That is who we are. So we know that when justice come, we, uh, comes, we can sing a song of praise because we've been waiting for it. And we're not rejoicing because the other is being taken out, the party we disagree with, the group we don't like. We're not rejoicing because of that. We're not even rejoicing because we have the ability to tread on snakes and scorpions. We're rejoicing in what the Lord has done for us. As Revelation said, it will be faith testimony. God has redeemed me from hell. If he's done the same for you, let's live it. Let's live it in such a way that others come running. That this season we are going through now would be considered the second dark ages and left behind as such. That we go forward in love, agape love, the choice. Mercy, kindness and grace living the fruit of the spirit the armor of God and the faith to slay giants because the walls of Jericho fall when we praise and as the children of Israel were told them while they were marching around it if you can't praise keep silent because the inhabits the praises of his people and if we want him being in the middle of us in it with us. Maybe it's easier to see that He is as the omnipresent God when our focus is the fact that He's omnipresent, ever with us, ever faithful, Emmanuel. Never give up hope. I'll see you then.